God, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this opportunity to come together uh, with this family, this group of, of young adults, to, to dive into your word, to sing of your glory and your goodness. And so this evening, Spirit of God, do what you do. If, if there are areas of our lives where conviction is needed, change is needed, show that to us tonight as we read through this word. Um, lead us to a place of, of repentance, seeking forgiveness, and, um, and uh, receiving life and joy and peace in exchange. And, and also, Lord, where, where comfort is needed, encouragement, assurance, Holy Spirit, breathe upon us as we look through this psalm and encourage us and remind us of who you are and your great work in our life. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Two, two kind of phrases that you will never, uh, or that don't go well together uh, is uh, the blank family and trouble-free trips. The blank family, trouble-free road trips, trouble-free vacations, trouble-free trips. It's, it's like oil and water. There's not a single trip, vacation, journey, adventure that me and my family have encountered um, that is free of trouble. We, we, we run into trouble all the time. And not like, like, like bar fight trouble, but just like headache trouble. We are in need of dire help. And um, this, sum, this last summer was, was no different. Uh, this is all I know. So for my wife, I think sometimes it's the end of the world. But all I know is trouble on vacations and trips and adventures. And so this last summer, we made this plan um, we got this little trailer that we all squeeze into to go camping, and we made this plan. We're going to take the trailer down to Southern California, and we're going to go ca camping in this place that my wife and I are familiar with. And, and so we do this, and, and my wife, like the week of, before we leave, she says, you know what? I think we need to like just spend the money, and we need to get a hotel just halfway there. Break up the trip for the kids. Um, it'll help with better attitudes. And, and I think the attitudes were more our attitudes, it'll help with our attitudes if we broke the trip up a little bit, you know? So, so, so the first half of the trip, we drive four hours, five hours or so, and, and we get a hotel, and, and we, we stay the night there, and most of us got sleep. It was okay. And then the next day, we're on the road by eight, and I'm figuring, man, it's maybe a four or five hour drive the rest of the way to get where we need to go. And, um, and so we begin driving, and, and again, attitudes are okay, morale is, is okay. Um, there is a DVD player in the car, so that tends to help most of the time. And, um, and then all of a sudden, man, I, I, we, we approach the grapevine. Are you guys familiar with driving to Southern California? We approach the grapevine and the hills of the grapevine. And for me, um, as, and my wife too, as, as two individuals who used to live in Southern California, born down there, when we are north driving south and we see the hills of the grapevine, we know we are close, right? You, you know, man, there's, there's something beautiful just on the other side. If we can get through there, 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 our destination is right there. And so we approach the grapevine, and uh, I am probably 10, hour, 10 miles from an exit that we were going to stop at and get lunch. And, and wouldn't you know it, um, no, I'm four, mile, I'm four miles from the exit, and all of a sudden my power steering locks up. And I have very little control of the vehicle and my gauges are going and everything. And so I am able to just kind of steer it off to the side of the road slowly. My wife didn't know what was happening until she felt the bumps and we were on the side of the road. And she's freaking, I'm, I'm like, what's, she's saying, what's going on? I'm saying, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Turn the car off. Turn the car on. Not starting. <laughs> turn the car off. Turn the car on. Not starting. What, Nathan, what's going on? Nothing. It's okay. Um... I think we're out of gas. I think we just hit empty. You see, as I saw it, my metrics were telling me I had 10 miles in the tank. I knew I was cutting it close, but I was four miles to my destination. So I thought, man, I got 10 miles. At where we are, we are going to be great. I didn't want to stop and, and slow us down, um, but I don't think... Um, the gauges on my vehicle were accounting for the 5,000 pounds I was towing behind the vehicle. And so we were out of gas and I was in need of help. <laughs> in the middle of the afternoon on the side of I-5, four miles from gas and I got to make some decisions. What do I do? Do I leave the kids? Do I send Rebecca ahead? Do I send Rebecca and the kids? We got some scooters on the gravel side. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I, I jam down on a little razor <laughs> on this gravel uh, side, whatever. And and, and I'm, I remember like, oh my goodness, praise God, we have help. 
I have AAA, like roadside assistance. <laughs> it's like the Holy Spirit, right, on the other side of the phone, like, I need your help. And so I call, and, and uh, two hours later, they come, and uh, I put five gallons in, and I get us to the stop. We launch. I fill us up. Man, okay, a little trouble, but, but we got help, and, and we're good. We're on our way. And so we begin our journey through the grapevine, and uh, we are but an hour from um, my gas fiasco, and, and cars are honking at us. People are driving. I'm like, I don't think I cut you off. I know I'm pulling a trailer. Maybe I'm going a little slower than you want. But we had no clue what was going on. And again, Haven, again, steering wheel locks up. Gauges flashing. Engine starting to steam a little bit. And again, my wife, freaky. What's going on? Kids are asleep. Shh, don't wake up. And I, I'm able to just kind of veer us off to the side of the road safely, hit an exit, and just coast down into a parking stop in Gorman, California, on the shadiest corner with drug deals midday taking place right behind us. And, and as soon as I put that thing in park, the engine starts smoking, not fire, just smoking. And my wife, as she should, uh, freaks out, starts unbuckling kids, waking them up and getting them out of the car um, to find that a very important pump hose in my engine, the, the very thing that cools the engine, had snapped. So all these people that were honking at me and yelling at me were seeing fluid and liquid just gushing out of my vehicle, and they were trying to warn me. So this is all on the same trip, guys. This isn't a different day. Same day on the side of the road, 2 p.m. on a Sunday, and it's a hundred and hell outside in Gorman, California, and I am in need of help calling anyone and everyone finally found a shop that was open back a couple miles in Lebec. And I said, can you come? Can you get me? We think we could work on you today. We have a tow service. We'll get to you. Hours pass. I got a trailer. Can you take my, no, you're going to have to dump the trip. So we drop the trailer, pray to God, no one breaks in. And we take the car and, um, and we jump onto this tow truck. And, and, and as the tow truck came, I said, my man, I got I got four kids, a wife. Can you get us all there? I don't want to leave my wife and kids here. And I didn't even think about me staying, I guess. I just thought, it's, I'm going with the car. I guess they should come with us, too. And, and, and he said, no, we can't have anyone ride in the vehicle. And I'm like, dude, what, what do you mean? You got, like, you don't have seatbelts? What's going on? Car seats? He says, no, um, you just get in your car, and I'll tow you. Haven, it was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. It wasn't just like a tow truck. It was a flatbed tow truck, which you think would be like a fun Disneyland experience, like we're on a ride. But Haven, this guy was hugging corners. And when you're on top, like eight feet up in the air, no control of your vehicle, but you feel the whole vehicle going this way, it was the scariest thing. And, uh, and I think my kids enjoyed that part. Um, but before we even got to that part, one of my kids, not even a teenager, but with the tone of a teenager, wow, this is the best vacation ever. <laughs> I said, you know what, son? Here's the deal. You're going to get back to school this summer, and no one's going to have this story. No one's going to have this vacation, so you love it. In need of help, and yet someone came to my rescue. And any of you guys have road trips kind of like that? You feel like every time you go on vacation, you go on an adventure, a journey, something radical like that happens. Maybe some of you cannot identify with the idea of a journey or a trip. Maybe some of you guys have peaceful vacations. I'd love to hear what that's like. I don't know. <laughs> I see movies, but I've never met anyone in real life like that. But, but however, in the journey of life, as we live our lives, especially as, as, well, whether you follow Jesus or not, we will encounter problems. We will encounter issues in our lives. We will encounter circumstances that we did not prepare for. Maybe circumstances we knew of and we just made some poor decisions, like not getting gas at the Arco in Lost Hills along I-5. Or maybe there are things that you cannot account for, and yet circumstance finds yourselves on the side of the road of life crying out for help. I want you to know that through the psalm that we're going to look at tonight, that God is your help, that God is our 
helper, that regardless of what you may face, whether you plan for it or not, we need to know that as we live life, however hard and whatever circumstances may come about, that God is our helper. Psalm 121, and here on Sunday nights and amongst our young adults, we're working through a selection of the Psalms, and many of your Bibles would title this Song of Ascents. It's probably in smaller print underneath Psalm 121. You'll see this small title, Song of Ascents. And what this simply means, it's, it's just a note to us and maybe some historical context that three times a year, Three times a year, according to Jewish law, according to God's desire, that the Jews were to make their way from wherever they live back to the city of Jerusalem, back to the temple for worship. Three times a year, there were three festivals, three feasts that they were to engage in. They would come and they'd make sacrifice. They'd praise God. And some of the feasts, it's praising God for the harvest, for what they've grown for, for the thing that God has given them. And some of the feasts were simply just making sacrifice to God, praising God, remembering the stories that they heard of how God passed over their ancestors, saved their lives, how God comforted and was everything that their ancestor needed as they journeyed in the desert. There were three feasts a year. They were to come back to the city and they were to worship God and engage these feasts. And these psalms, this selection of psalms from 120 to 134, these songs were sung, were considered, were, were uh, uh, maybe even prayed as they journeyed along their way back to Jerusalem. Some people didn't have to journey far because maybe they lived in the city or just outside the city walls. Some maybe had to journey hours. Some maybe had to journey days and weeks. And these songs were often referenced and, and sung about as they journeyed back to the city. These weren't just uh, road trip songs to pass the time. <laughs> these were spiritual, uh, intentional songs of truth to prepare the heart as they journeyed back. And so for us as a young adult ministry, we are working through these psalms as well as our church at large is working through the whole book of psalms. We're just going to look at these 14, 15 psalms. And so tonight is Psalm 121. Say, Jesus, if you're there. Jesus. Here we go. Psalm 121. God, the help of those who seek him. This is one of the song of a sense. Verse 1. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Say hills. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You see, the city of Jerusalem that these men and women would travel to, even if you went to the city today, the city of Jerusalem sits on top of a hill surrounded by other hills. Jerusalem isn't, on, isn't uh, sitting atop the highest hill. It's just a hill amongst other hills. And often, this is just maybe Bible fact for you as you read through the Bible, you might notice this, but whenever Jerusalem is referenced, whenever the temple is spoken of, it is all referenced directionally as going up. It is a high place. It is a high place that you would visit. So the song of ascents to go up, this is we're going up to the city. It's referenced that way, just again, Bible facts, referenced that way geographically. It sits on top of a hill. I believe it's also referenced that way as, as that city was a special place of God as it is to be revered and honored and respected. So here we are back in the Psalms. The psalmist, the pilgrims would journey from wherever they lived back to the city up. And just like some of us maybe who travel to Southern California see the hills of the grapevine, so these men and women would see these hills ahead of them. And it would remind them and it would let them know that we are close. That the journey is not yet done, but, but it is coming to a conclusion. And those hills would represent and reference God as their helper. Regardless of how far they've come, man, we can see the place of worship just ahead. 
I wonder, anyone uh, ever been there where you have a vacation or a trip, a route that you go regularly, and there's some touch points that when you see, you know you are close? Anyone? You just drive, you're like, I see that place. I know, man, I, this, I'm on the last leg of my trip. For us as a kid, um, when we moved up here to Redding, my grandparents still lived in Southern California, and we'd take... Uh, my dad would teach, preach on Sundays, and we'd get off, and, and we'd have to leave mid-afternoon. So we'd get into Grandma and Grandpa's house like middle of the night. But, but we knew if, if we were awake at a certain hour and we saw all these lights off to the right, the south of the highway, we knew, man, we were close. Little did we know the, the, the area that was well lit that we were getting excited about was the, the Budweiser factory. I don't know if my parents appreciated that, but we knew as soon as we saw uh, the Budweiser factory, we were close to grandma and grandpa's house. Well, these hills were not just a reminder that their journey was to come to a conclusion, that they were close to uh, their destination, but these hills were also a reminder of who got them there, of who protected them, who um, guided them and guarded them along their journey, as well as whatever is to happen ahead. Who was their help? Verse 2, my help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. You see, the help of these people, and I believe the help of you and I today, was not just a great person you could always count on, AAA, thank you. No, this helper was not just a man you knew would pick up the phone when you called, but this helper was the creator of the universe. It's not just a trustworthy individual, it is God, creator of everything. And these hills, again, were not just a reminder once, but every journey into the city that God was their help, that God was their provider, that God was their protector. I wonder how many of you here, like, there are often things that come about in your life and, and it will be forever connected to God. It's forever a memory or a reminder that God is in your life. Maybe a sight, maybe a, a sound, a song that you hear. Man, it takes you back to that place that God spoke to you. Maybe it's, maybe it's a book you read. Maybe it's a, a smell uh, at the holidays or something. It's just forever connected to God and God speaking to you who he is. I know for me, I used, to, um, I used to stress a lot about finances when I was in college. Not that I don't stress about it now, but, but then it was just like to a very, like I'm checking my bank account like five, ten times every hour, and I didn't go anywhere. But I'm just stressing, like did, did the money leave? Did someone break in? Like what's going on? Like OCD issues. And, and I would constantly talk to God about it. And, uh, and I remember specifically, uh, even still to this day, there was, uh, before I was doing this, I, I was, before I was leading and pastoring, I was acting. And so when, when you're an actor and you're in commercials or TV or movies, you get residual checks. You don't just get paid for the thing that you did. You get paid constantly every time it airs. And so there was money that I knew would maybe come in, but I wouldn't count on. But I remember one time specifically overwhelmed by finances, and walking into my agent's office and asking her, hey, by any chance, are there any checks here? And she's like, let me check. And, and check, 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 check. She pulled out multiple checks that covered the rest of the cost of my car and all these issues and finances that I was anxious over. And I just began, I got in my car that day after I visited her and I just wept. And God just spoke to me so sincerely I will take care of you. Never again do you have to worry. I will take care of you. And even to this day, when I get checks, they're like $2 checks now, but still, the, the, the physical example that this check like, is and, and what it represents, that God is my provider, that God is my help. I wonder if you have something like that, maybe tangible, physical. Maybe it's a place that you have to go to every once in a while to just check back in and know that, that God is our help. You know, 
God is their help. And again, he's not just a trustworthy individual, but he is creator of all. I have found for me in my life, I don't know what it's like in your life, but I have found whenever I'm able to slow down a little bit in the midst of circumstances, anxieties, pressures, whenever I'm able to slow down and look at all of my trouble, look at all of my anxieties or circumstances, and hold them up in comparison to God himself and his resume, even some of the things that I worry over become so laughable in knowing who my God is. Help comes from God, the maker of heaven and earth. Haven, there is nothing, nothing too big, uh, too strong, too sophisticated for God to correct, heal, restore, or breathe life into. God is our helper. Maybe you and I need to be reminded of this tonight, this very psalm. The psalmist did. The pilgrims needed it. So here it is. Here we just transition. In verse 1 and 2, the psalmist is speaking more personal, first person I. And here it takes a transition in verse 3. It moves from I to you. And I don't know of the context and if the psalmist writing it was writing about himself or herself and then to those that may be reading or if there was a priest along the journey in the original experience the original writing and authorship of this and and the priest would hear maybe of the people wondering where their help comes from seeing the hills restored re-encouraged reminded and then maybe a priest would speak up in these following verses just to emphasize, to speak to the individual that they wouldn't lose heart or, or, or lose sight. Look at this, verse 3. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Hey, even we got to be reminded, God is always aware and alert. Always aware and alert. He will not allow your foot to be Move. Listen, God will not allow you to, to stagger, to sway, to shake, to slip to your death. He will make your foot strong, sturdy, and steady. In the context of those that wrote this psalm, as well as those that, that sung this psalm along their journey, the roads they traveled, they, they weren't I-5. They weren't beautiful, straight paths, even maybe with a little gravel on the side. I for sure could not razor along many of those roads, could not scooter those, those roads. Some of those roads were narrow. Some of those roads were along mountain sides that if you are to slip, if you are to sway, that you will surely plummet to your death. And yet here the psalmist reminding those that are traveling, that God will keep us, that God will help us, that God will protect us. He is alert and always ready to protect you and I. Maybe I've told this story before, but there was a time with me and my family where we, we took the kids uh, hiking up in Lassen, and we hiked um, Bumpus Hell. Is that it? Is that the name of it? Like, Sulfur, stinky eggs when you get there. Yeah, yeah. So we hike, we were hiking this trail and, and on our way back, I I Rebecca was a champ. She was pregnant and taking care of a kid. I, I'm holding a kid on my back and I got a, a kid in front of me and we're walking and, and it's a fairly narrow trail at the point of, of this part of the, the hike. And and just ahead of me was a mom and husband and their four kids and they are just like hugging the side of the rock. And the mom is yelling, get over here, get over here, yelling at the kids to hug the rock. And, and she chose to use my family as an example, which I don't, I don't know. I could talk with her about it at some other point, but she's like, look at that kid. He just almost died. Get over here. Get close. Right? Like, and I'm for parents helping each other out, but like, don't throw my kid under the bus for it, right? Or my parenting, let alone under the bus, right? But here's the thing. I have not God by any means, but I knew exactly where my kids were. 
I not only was watching their very step, but I was watching the path ahead of them. I was constantly aware and alert as to should they slip, should they hit this next pothole or try and jump off this next rock, I know exactly where I need to be and will be to catch them so that they would not slide to their death. So is the case with God. He's not going to take every step for you. Some of the path he may hold your hand and some of the path he may just walk side by side watching your step and ready should you misstep and slip. He will be there to catch you. Always awake, always aware, always alert. Verse 3, he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Verse 4, behold, he who keeps Israel, the people of Israel, God's chosen people, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber, we're seeing a slumber theme here, shall neither slumber, meaning uh, become drowsy, kind of what some of you guys are doing right now, will neither slumber nor sleep. Listen, God watches us day and night. God does not leave his post, nor does he fall asleep at his post. God is standing guard on your life and my life and the lives of those that call him God. Maybe in the illustration of road trips and adventures and vacations, God's probably like the best co-pilot to road trip with, right? No one wants to journey with someone and road trip with someone that just falls asleep as soon as they get in the car, right? No, don't point or look at anyone. No, no, sharp, I said no sharp looks, husbands and wives, okay? No one wants to get, you know, on a, start a road trip with someone that just falls asleep as soon as they get in the car, amen? Anyone? Okay, two people. Especially if they're the driver. You don't want them falling asleep if they're the driver, right? I love my wife dearly, and I did get permission to talk about her in this context, but my wife falls asleep all the time in the car. I will go on any adventure. I will travel the world with my wife, but I have come to recognize that shortly into the drive, she's falling asleep. It's done. I mean, the first real drive, like road trip, as a husband, wife, come back from our honeymoon, we pack her up. She was living in Salem, Oregon. We're moving down to Reading. I got a U-Haul full. I got my wife, my bride. Like, yeah, we're doing this. We're starting life. I'm not 10 minutes into the drive. 10 minutes. Like, we just started our life. We got back. We went to Hawaii. Let's, yeah, this is great. Let's talk. Let's, 10 minutes. <laughs> Sawing logs against the window of the U-Haul. And I gotta take this six hour drive by myself. She's still great to road trip with. Full disclosure, I guess, because she will uh, be frustrated with me if I don't admit this. There was a drive, though. There was a drive. Uh, uh, I. I it was a long night. It was a long drive. And, and you know, when, like the, the temperature's just right in the car and you've got like just the right amount of layers. And, and she did scream at me. This happened once where she felt the semi next to us was getting a little closer to her window than she wanted. And so I, yeah, okay, I'll help you out there. So there was one time where maybe I got a little too cozy. Uh, but, but God keeps watch day and night. He does not get drowsy. He's not going to doze off in the middle of your life. Sorry, I missed the last 10 years. Where are we at? What happened? No, no, no. He is awake. He is alert day and night. Verse 5, the Lord is your keeper. He's your protector. There's a continued theme here. He watches over us. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is the shade, is your shade at your right hand. Hand seems a little unique and interesting, doesn't hold a lot of context for us, maybe. See, the right hand in, in this day and age was, was the hand of strength. It was a sign of, of power and, and strength, and you did everything with your right hand. And so the author is saying, man, God will guard your strength, your power. The thing you are known by God will, will shade your right hand. Verse 6, the sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Again, this, this protector imagery continued. He is our helper, not just going to help us out in a pinch, but he is our helper in that he will guard us and he will guide us. 
you and I both know by now that the enemy, speaking of Satan or any enemy in any context, gives no regard for the hour of day in which they attack. They don't care what hour it is, whether you're sleeping or not. Satan doesn't care whether, whether you have enough strength right now to fight or not, or, or doesn't care if you're losing sleep because of a beautiful baby boy who is just so full of life. Baby Owen, thank you for joining us. He doesn't care how tired you are, how cranky you are, how anxious you are, how nervous you are. He gives no regard to any hour of the day in his attacks. God guards and God guides at all hours of the day. Some of you guys remember, remember the Old Testament? Remember the Israelites? Remember them stuck in the desert for 40 years? Remember that? Could have used Google, right? Could have used Apple Maps maybe. Might have helped a little bit. That's not why they were lost. They had other issues. But, but you remember that? You remember what God did for them? He guarded and guided day and night. Pillar of fire during the night, cloud during the day. What did that do? How did that, that guard? Well, the fire, I'm not, I'm not probably trying to attack anyone that's surrounded by fire. That looks pretty scary, so I'm going to stay away. So the fire protected the Israelites. The fire also guided the Israelites as it illuminated their path in the middle of the night. The cloud was, was the very thing in which during the day they were to follow that it would guide them. The cloud also provided them protection, covering, guarded them from the, the beating sun in the middle of the desert. God is our protector. God guards, God guides day and night. Finally, in the last two verses, the song closes this way. The Lord shall preserve you. The Lord shall keep you, right? The Lord shall protect you. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The soul, this word used soul, is, is referencing your neck, your throat, the very organs in which you use to breathe and live, that God shall preserve your life. Verse 8, the Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Again, a reminder to those journeying that not only has God been our protector along this journey to the point in which we've come, where we now see the hills, where we now see the destination, not only has God protected us, but he will continue to protect us the rest of the journey until we get into the city to sacrifice and offer. And not only will he protect us the rest, but he will protect us forevermore, period. Period. Now, I don't know if you guys are keeping track, but I think this psalm ends a lot better than the psalm last week. I don't know if any of you guys recall the psalm last week, frustrated, discouraged, like, I speak truth, but everyone just wants war, period. It's like, oh, that's not really a little, like, go win one for Christ type of, type of song. I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm really cheering that one, but this song, this song ends that, that God will guide us, God will protect us, protect us, preserve us, going out, coming in forever more. This was a song sung as the people of God journeyed into the city three times a year to make sacrifices and to worship God. And I can't help but wonder, could this song, could this psalm also be for you and I tonight? Over the course of our journey with Jesus, we will face many obstacles. Over the course of our journey with Jesus, we will encounter a multitude of enemies and circumstances and situations where we will need help. Many suggest that a life with Jesus is not necessarily lived on a playground, but a battleground. And I think that makes for interesting bumper stickers, but I think there is some truth to that. That's not saying that a life with Jesus is not fun and cannot be fun and joyful and hopeful. I think those that make this statement, battleground, playground, what they're simply trying to 
encourage the believer in is that it is not void of problems and issues and circumstances that leave us in need of help. But a life with Jesus, though not void of problems, is promised with help, promised with Jesus himself. And so much like these men and women on their journey to Jerusalem, to worship, they were reminded of who their protector was and who their helper was. So can you and I, this evening, given whatever circumstances you find yourself in, be assured, reassured, and promised that God is our help, that he is our helper. As Whitney comes up, maybe for some of you here tonight, for some of us, myself included, maybe what we need to hear tonight from God is look up. Look up. The very place in which this psalm started, I looked up and saw the hills. Maybe some of us are living too much of our life, and we would even say with God, not looking up at him, but looking down at the circumstances before us. And God is simply saying, eyes up here, eyes up here, look up. I am your help, I am your protector. I will guide you and I will guard you through this very thing that is consuming you. Look up. Haven, your love, and as long as you and I keep our eyes on Jesus, we are assured and promise that he will be there for us. He is our help. For the original reader, they would journey in Jerusalem singing these songs, reminding them or their souls of these truths. And so too do I think it's so valuable and so important to know that on our journey, maybe not into Jerusalem, but maybe our journey into the new Jerusalem, into eternity with God, that our eyes need to be on Jesus. Reminded that we have not just good help, not just AAA roadside assistance, but we have the creator of heaven and earth guiding us and guarding us. Let me pray. We're going to close our time in, in song, and this is opportunity for, for you and I to respond to the Lord and to consider maybe the many areas in, in your life in times past and even present where God has shown up and revealed himself to you. Or maybe maybe there's times where he's done it in the past, but you've forgotten, and tonight he's reminding you. Maybe there's a a symbol, there's a word, there's a verse, there's something that he's reminding you of that he gave to you years ago, and he gave that to you to remind you that he is your help, that he has not forgotten you and his eyes are upon you. So as, as I pray and as we close in song and meditation of the words of of Psalm 121, would we find rest in our God, our great helper? Your help, my help, comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. God, we thank you for these opportunities. We thank you that um, just as your people came into the city and, and along the journey as well as in the middle of the city, they were reminded of who you are and how great you are. I thank you that as We've journeyed from varying circumstances just to get here tonight. That as we approach this very address, we are reminded of you as our help. That as we sit in the context with with family and friends here this evening, that we are reminded that you are our protector, that you guide us, that you guard us. And so, Holy Spirit, would you seal this work in us as we close in song and meditation and in prayer name of Jesus.